thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for your time, everyone, today. I recognise that this is an incredibly sensory environment to begin to try and attend to task. So I'm hoping that I'm talking loud enough and slow enough so that it's not too distracting, but certainly keep in touch. It's a privilege for me today to be able to join with you. It's uh, really a, a precious time when we start to think about beginning the world of solids or for those of us that are expecting what that might look like when we go from our breast and bottle feeding or for some early ones that come prematurely from tube feeding into that universe of solid foods. So fortunately for me, I've been very privileged to join with thousands of families over the years um, to problem solve together. Um, through that world of mealtimes. It's not about one way is the right way and there is a plethora of evidence out there um, that, and a plethora of advice that people tell you a lot about what to do. But honouring yourself and your knowledge of your beautiful family, you guys are the experts of your children and that's what we're going to work through today. So who here is um, just starting to think about that world of solids? Yep, starting to think about solid foods for some and who's more wanting to know a bit more about fussy eating? Yeah, okay, so we've got a bit, of, a bit of both. For those that are walking past today, we're thinking about solids and fussy eating. So let's think about that and how we can begin to do that sensitively. What we know is that every single one of us um, interacts with our universe through our senses. So we notice, we hear that background noise, we see as people wander past. We engage with our little people as we feel them wriggle or see them look up at us and we fall in love. So we notice those smells, those sights, those sounds. We absolutely celebrate that parents, you are the experts of your children, of how they were in your womb, how it is that those early experiences, both through the birth and as we welcome them into the universe, you know their attributes. You know what they love, what bothers them, what frustrates them, what they prefer, what they notice, and then what they don't. So to remember today, that even amongst this universe of information, there's no right way to do things. Every one of us has a brain that's kind of like Play-Doh. It's plastic and it's changeable. So for those of you that may have had a wobbly start, you can create new memories and new experiences that can change a very reluctant, fussy infant and toddler into a child that really does love to enjoy a family meal time. You can also have a wobbly start and then also change that experience when it comes to solid foods. So in sensational mealtimes, we are able to explore and reflect together rather than give advice. So recognising and celebrating your unique attributes and your preferences, your family's routines, your culture and how you want mealtimes to be. So when we're thinking about sensitive caregiving, we really are understanding that children constantly use their senses to connect with us. So they use their eyes before they use their words, but they use their movements when I'm excited. Yeah, hey, that's a beautiful little smile. Thanks, dude. And we use that to communicate. So sometimes well before words, it's the way we move, the way we groove, the way we make sounds that will tell us whether they want more or less. And our sensory preferences influence how we learn about our world, how we learn to move and play. Whether we want more of something, we wriggle towards. Whether we want less, we shake away. They make sense of how things feel and whether they are dangerous or safe. So has anyone here heard people say, that's okay, your baby won't remember in the early years? What we do know that that's one of those really big myths out there. Babies and young children do remember. But the good thing is we know that we can create new memories. So if they've had negative or stressful or traumatic experiences early on, we can create new, more enjoyable memories that override that experience. So whether it is dangerous or whether it is safe is stored in the middle part of our brain called the amygdala. And it's something that's really important to honour at a meal time because children don't say no to a food because they, want, um, because they just want to annoy us as parents. They say no to a food for a reason. And one of the things we know is that our babies and our children have really two things that they can control in their universe. What goes in and how it comes out. And that's about it. So it's really important that we honour that choice for them and respect that role. But how do we do that? So let's think about that. So our sensory preferences, so whether we like more or less, is shaped by our genetics so what we are born with, but also by our environment and our surroundings. So we have sensory thresholds in our brain that impact on whether we like more of something 
or whether we like less of something. So if we are more sensitive, a little bit of a sound can actually sound like a lot. So if we're thinking about some of us that are more sensitive to sound, some of our babies get really bothered by vacuum cleaners and um, trucks going down the street, washing machines, they get distracted and distressed easily. They wake easily and startle. But for someone who has a, a much higher threshold, then that means we're far less sensitive. So lots and lots of sensory input kind of goes, yeah, that feels good. So a baby that has a far higher threshold or a child or one of us to a sensory input often tolerates lots more. So some of those kids are the ones that actually go to sleep right next to the washing machine because they like that background noise, they like that input. What we need to remember is that for every sense we have a different threshold. So we might like more noise but less touch. So nappy change and bath time can kind of be tricky. Or the feel of food on my hand might feel a bit icky and I don't like that. So tuning into our preferences is really important. We also need to recognise that our previous experiences do influence what we prefer. So for most of us, there's a reason why we love a certain food or we love to eat at a restaurant or we love a busy cocktail party or for some of us, we don't. We much prefer that quiet, sort of romantic dinner. We prefer a quiet meal at home. There's a reason. And when we actually tune in to what we like, it helps us to think about maybe what will our baby or our child like and what is it that creates those feelings in them. Who here has, let's, let's think about it together, let's think about a food you, you really love. Think about a favourite food. Feel the salivation starting to happen in your mouth and think about the feelings when you think about when you smell that delicious beautiful fruit or deluxe chocolate or that delicious coffee and how it makes us feel. So we're thinking about the feelings that come with that ex experience. And then let's think about a never food, a food that we never want to eat or drink. So some of you may have had that experience where something looked delicious and you took a bite and you had it in your mouth and you went, oh, this is really gross and you want to spit it out. And you know what? As adults, we actually have the opportunity to spit it out. Lots of our expectations around young kids is that we actually don't want our kids to spit their food out. But actually, it's a really normal part of learning how to tolerate things that we may not like the feel of or the taste of or the smell of in our mouth. So honouring that in our kids is really important. It is. So let's think about that. Early experiences are absolutely remembered in our midbrain and in our danger centres. Okay. So let's think about tuning in. So we need to reflect together. Think about what your baby prefers at other times of the day. What does your child prefer at bath time? Do they tolerate going into a shopping centre? Do they like eating a meal out and about when they're feeding, whether that be breastfeeding or bottle feeding? Let's wonder early about what they prefer and what they love. And then we also think about what bothers them. And what is it about what bothers them that might start to influence when they start solid food? Because we don't want those what bothers them to be around when they begin that journey of solid food because that can get them over aroused or distressed very quickly. So thinking about what we prefer directly gives us a lens through which we view our children and our babies. So if we have a really high threshold, if we have a, prefer more sens sensation in our day, then we are very tolerant and often we can tolerate a lot more from our babies and our children. But if we're far more sensitive, sometimes we get bothered by things in our children and our kids a lot more quickly. For those of us that are a bit more visually sensitive, sometimes we get really overwhelmed with the mess and we kind of like it to be a lot more organised. I feel calm inside when things in our home look organised. That's because visually I get overwhelmed with lots of these things I'm seeing. It's not always a reality with little people in our life that that's achievable, but it's knowing that that's our lens through which we actually also view our child and how we view their behaviour and their responses. So sometimes our sensory preferences between our child or our baby and us are different and also between our partners or our grandparents or our, or our siblings. So for those of you that are expecting or that are new parents with babies that haven't started solids yet, spend time wondering about what you and your baby prefer. Think about those early, early experiences with milk feeds and how what goes on now might influence those early days of solid foods and how it might be impacting on your baby or young child's food preferences. 
And when we observe and tune into our child's signals and cues, notice how they respond, the subtleties of their interactions from their surroundings. Discover what they notice and what they detect, what bothers them or what they love, what they tolerate and what they actually really actively might be wanting to avoid. So let's think about that together in a bit more detail. Okay. So the power of experiences. Who here, when you were younger, went to the fridge and grabbed out that bottle of milk and actually had a drink of that milk or juice straight from the fridge? Who's done that in their past? And who did it and it was sour? It was off. How would that make you feel? It's gross and it gives you a big response. Or if we think about if we actually had gastro. Who here has eaten something, then ended up with gastro, revisited it a lot and then kind of can't go near that food? Or drink, if we think about that. <laughs> so the power of experience is very powerful. If you had a food that you ate and then got really sick with, even the sight of that food now might make your tummy turn. Or the smell of it. Or someone even mentioning that word for me, it's kind of like mushrooms. And I'm like, ooh. It has a very, um, a very strong neurological impact. So we're thinking about the sensory properties of the food actually register in the danger centre in our brain based on those experiences. So for our little ones, things like ear infections, constipation, reflux, um, and it doesn't have to be lots of, it can be small episodes for some children that can make them really sensitive and really bothered by those things. And if it's then associated with a certain type of food, it might be the colour of the food, it might be the smell of it, it might be the sound of mum using the blender as she's pureeing. And those sounds can trigger what we call a danger centre response in our kids. So we need to understand that if our child is saying no, it might be for a reason. But on the other hand, we also need to know with new sensory experiences like starting food, we need to experience that taste or that texture between 10 to 20 times before we even register it as the same thing. So a carrot that is steamed or roasted or sticks or circles is actually like four completely different types of food. And what they are when we harvest them in one month versus the other side of the year is also different because fruit and veg are seasonal. So if you've got a reluctant or fussy eater or someone who's more sensitive, I like tomatoes in February. I don't like tomatoes any other months of the year because they're not sun ripened. They've not got that same smell and that same taste. And so really thinking and tuning in, we see and have a lot of parents say, my child only eats things out of a packet. I'm producing this incredibly beautiful homemade produce, but they won't eat it. Why will my child reject all of this beautiful thing that I create, but they'll eat it out of a squeezy pouch or they'll eat it out of a packet? There's a reason. Okay? Things that are produced in packets are generally predictable. They look the same, they come out the same, they taste the same, they feel the same and they smell the same. They are heat treated so that there's none of those bacteria and things in there anymore that actually are none of the good stuff either that actually can be really... Um, Important, and so one of the things when we're using those packaged foods and our kids like them, it tells us that they can be really bothered by the variety that comes with homemade produce because it might feel different or smell different or look different. So when we tune into that and know that those previous experiences may have made us a little bit more sensitive, we can begin to think about how we can create things at home that might match those packaged foods. So it might be the look of it, it might be the feel of it, it might be the smell of it that we need to match to our children's preferences. And that's what Sensational Meal Times helps us do. It's working out what is it about our always foods that our child accepts, the sometimes foods and the never foods, because never foods are like a danger centre trigger. So let's think about that a little bit more. Okay. So our just right early experiences. When things have gone awry early, we can create new memories. We can help our children that are rejecting our food to actually begin to enjoy food or to stretch the range that they're going to accept and tolerate. If you have a child that has had a negative or a worrisome, painful or distressing experience that's influencing daily routines, Sensational Meal Times is a problem-solving book that can help you. So there's never one right way to begin. And there, even amongst all of the advice that's out there, you will find something there that is going to be useful for you. But know that you honour and know your family and your child's early experience and how that might be influencing your sensory preferences. 
So this kind of demonstrates the, the busyness, the willy-willy of meal times, the overwhelming sensory experience that happens six to eight times a day when we begin eating solid food. It's incredibly complex and we start with our surroundings of food and thinking about the sounds of food preparation, the smells, and then we start to think about the feels, the sights, and before we even bring it towards feeling it with our hands, never mind, feeling it with our lips, our teeth, our tongue, and then ingesting it. So problem solving through all of this is really, really helpful. So who here knows a child that struggles with meal times? Things like, I don't I don't eat fruit, they don't eat meat, I only eat white things. Let's wonder about that. Why would someone only eat white food? Well, let's, let's think. It generally doesn't have colour. It has far less smell. It's either silky smooth or it's bite and dissolve in our mouth. So if we only eat crisps or chips or yoghurt or white things, there's actually a reason. It's not because our children want to bother us and be really annoying, even though those feelings inside of us can be incredibly frustrating there's actually a reason behind why they prefer those things. And it's how we can begin to problem solve through that. It's also to know you're not alone. 50% of children and families wobble at meal times. It's tricky stuff because of how complex it is. It's the most sensorily overwhelming moment in the day. And that's from early feeding right through. So you're not alone with the big feelings. These big feelings do happen six to eight or more times a day. Now, many of you may have been told, don't worry about it, your child will grow out of it. Or don't worry about it, they'll eat when they're hungry. My child did or you did. What we know from the research is actually, and from the way the brain works, is that we don't grow out of it. If we keep exposing our children in stressful, frustrating, anger-ridden ways, that creates new memories, that this is a really angry, frustrating, stressful thing. Or if we keep pushing and get more stressful, then it actually turns hunger off. If you think about when you guys are really stressed, what sort of food do you go for? We go for stuff that feels good, that's comforting, that gives us nice feelings. So we need to honour that when we're thinking about it with our kids and we problem solve through it because it's tough. Okay, thinking about these big feelings, we know from our research just how big this can get. And every single family that we connect with honours us with sharing just how frustrating it can be and just how alone we can feel at different times. One thing to know is that our brains are plastic. Things can change and we can create new memories. But there's also this thing called good enough parenting. So give yourself permission to know that we all make mistakes. And good enough parenting is kind of like you've got to get it right 30% of the time. How good a statistic is that? Okay, 30% of the time we, we need to get it right and think about that. So really honouring your feelings and thinking about the feelings of your child as we think about mealtimes. Also know that how we feel is tuned in to by our kids. So the more stressed we get, the more stressed our children get. It's called the mirror neurons in our brain. So there's no such thing as faking it. If you're worried, the first point of call is to look after yourself. Okay, get someone to help you so that you can help your kids. Because if you're really frustrated, they're going to tune into that stuff. Okay, look after you first and foremost. Okay, so our danger centre. This is where we experience that fight, flight, fight, fright response. And when we get cross at mealtimes or when we see something that might trigger a worrisome, so if you think about that food that you really don't ever eat, if that gets put in front of you, how does that make you feel? If you have a child who doesn't like their food being contaminated or touching because all of a sudden this safe food that I always eat is touching that dangerous food, it can trigger a whole body response in our children. And of course, that often means mealtime's over. So distress does impact on appetite suppression and those feelings can last for some time. Okay, this is another reason to remind us why we don't push. So force feeding is one of those things that can be really tricky when we're incredibly frustrated, but it's also something that can leave a lasting memory for that child not to go near that food again. Or actually to avoid a high chair and a spoon or a bib, full stop, because it's incredibly overwhelming. So always, always look after yourself first. Okay. So sensational mealtimes is an important part of that jigsaw puzzle. Okay, it helps us to focus in on what we prefer, what our child prefers. How can we get that dance cooking so we can begin to stretch from just those few foods to more variety for food that might actually include meat or vegetables or whatever is the food group you're worried about that they're not eating. 
we focus on doing it sensitively and we do it with tuning into all of our feelings and empathising with that. Okay, so in the book, there's charts to help you with that problem solving. So Sensational Meal Times is actually about a workbook. It's not an advice-giving book. It's filled with loads and loads of wisdom that's gathered over the years from the evidence to help you with this problem solving journey. Thinking about the sensory properties you prefer, your child prefers, other members of the family, and how are they influencing the food that they eat or don't eat, and what can we do about that? Okay, so when we understand how our sensory experiences and preferences influence mealtimes, then we can begin to create mealtimes that feel emotionally safe, successful and pleasurable for everyone in our family. Mealtime harmony is achievable, but it often needs holding and care from everyone around us and how we can support each other. Denise, my dietitian colleague and myself, have done extensive research that underpins all of what we've shared today and also underpins our publication. So not only that, but Denise is also available as a clinician to support you and your family if you're wanting more help, as are lots of clinicians in the community. So guys, thank you so much for this brief snapshot that is of today, and I hope that all of you have a wonderful journey in discovering and, and stretching and exploring the world of solid foods with your babies, or hopefully continuing to expand the range and the beautiful nature of what solid meal times can be with your toddlers and other children. Thank you. Thank you.